If you follow me on Instagram, you'll know I love my gardening. I'm always posting about it. And it's always sort of needlessly offensive posts, just this sort of thing. I just call them all slags. <laughs> Big titted slags. <laughs> this is a squash. Looks like an upside down chode with a baggy foreskin. <laughs> I know what that looks like because I've met your dad. <laughs> Needlessly offensive posts. And as, as a result of these posts, I was asked to do an interview with Gardener's World magazine. <laughs> the most gentle Middle England publication you could ever hope to find. And I did this lovely interview with them. And they said afterwards, they said, oh, we need a high resolution picture of you in the garden for the magazine. And I said, well, I don't have one. And they said, can you get one? I said, it's locked down. I live on my own. But I got this camera and I set it up on a little timer and I got this picture, which I think is quite sweet, really. It's quite, I know, bless, I know, it's lovely. And they said, oh, it's lovely. Who took the photo? For a laugh, I said it was Lisa Scott Lee from Steps. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why I chose Lisa Scott Lee. I'm sat on some steps, maybe it was subconscious, I don't know. Magazine comes out, they printed her in the magazine. <laughs> she lives in Dubai. <laughs> and now, whenever she posts to Instagram, this is her saying steps got to number one in the charts, she credited me as the photographer. <laughs> I did, which I really recommend, I did loads of this, and it's really good for, my, for anyone's mental health, and it's really simple. All you do is troll Alan Sugar. It's so simple. <laughs> Alan Sugar, I'm sure you know who he is, a billionaire. He's, um, you what? Sorry, Lord Alan Sugar. <laughs> That's the lawyers over there. <laughs> it's Lord, actually, I think you'll find. Yes, Lord Wanker Alan Sugar. Um, <laughs> He's a billionaire, he's hosted The Apprentice, and at the start of lockdown, people were losing their jobs, their lives, it was an awful time. He posted this to Twitter, this is him next to his private jet during a global pandemic. Collected the new plane today, flew it down from Knoxville to Pompano Beach. I thought, you're not reading the room here, Alan. <laughs> so I replied to this tweet and I said, drove my Ford Fiesta home base today, but you don't see me tweeting about it. Either way, I'm horny, how about you? <laughs> This started an absolute flirt fest with Alan Sugar because he replied to this. He said, but you did tweet it, you double barrel pro. He thinks I'm a princess. That opened the floodgates to me flirting with him every morning in lockdown, sending this sort of thing. Good morning, my little Lord Sugar Pub. <laughs> I mean, I did so many. I sort of lost my mind, really, but I, I did it because I think he's a twat. I think he's lost it. I think he's a bell end, and I think he'll die before me, but um, <laughs> if he <laughs> I don't want him to win. And I thought about this. I was like, how do I win against Alan Sugar in death? And I solved this problem. And what I've done is I've rewritten my will. This is my actual will. This is page two. If you look at section six, Alan Sugar gets the Ford Fiesta. I support West Brom. Are there any football supporters in? Yeah. <laughs> oh, some people. Oh, you support. Who do you support? Ipswich Town. Ipswich Town. <laughs> Fuck <Yeah. laughs> They're taking over! <laughs> he hello there. Are you, is everything okay? <laughs> are, they doing, are they good? Are they doing all right? So I started becoming a fan of West Brom because my friend Karen said that they're the best team. Statistically inaccurate, that. <laughs> and so we went to watch one game. We went to watch one in the um, stadium. So I forgot the word stadium there. I was going to say velodrome. I can't do that. <laughs> we went to watch one in the stadium. But before that, we went to this proper old man pub in Birmingham and, like, the woman behind the bar, how to describe her? She looked like a scrotum. <laughs> she didn't like me because I ordered a white wine spritzer. <laughs> Fuck's that? <laughs> soda water and white wine. She went behind the bar for a worrying amount of time, came back with a pint of soda water and a full bottle of dessert wine. <laughs> I don't know, that would be a fiver. <laughs> Best night of my life. Oh, I, did, I got caught out at one point because I shouted, come on the lads. Apparently that's not acceptable as a phrase. <laughs> yes. I love an old man pub as well. Because I, I go with my friend Karen quite a lot. And there's one in Birmingham. Um, it's called the Tap and Spile. And it's open until about 4am every night. And it's like full of proper brummies with no neck. And um, <laughs> I haven't got a neck. And um, she got hit on the one night. This guy came up to her and he went, what's your name? And she went, fuck off. <laughs> That's a lovely name. <laughs> oh, and he asked her what her favourite TV show is. She said Sex in the City. And he went, oh, well, I like Sex on the City, you know. <laughs> it's a good joke, that. It's a bloody good joke. Um, 
But yes, I'm not that masculine, not that, um, not that good at confrontation. I did have to do some confrontation recently. You do a lot of driving with this job, and I stopped recently at a service station quite late at night, just getting some food. I wasn't getting any fuel, and this gentleman got off a motorbike behind me, who'd obviously worked on one muscle group more than the others in the gym, because he's quite sort of top-heavy, then sort of withered down below. <laughs> Like a cornetto with a head. <laughs> like a spinning top shaped into a twat. <laughs> very aggressive, very aggressive, really pushy. I went to the service station, he pushed him behind me. I went over to have a look at the sandwiches and he shouted to the woman behind the counter who was sat there with a little e cigarette, which was giving out a sarcastic amount of smoke, really, just sort of billowing around. Her. She looked like she was on bloody stars in their eyes, just like there. And, there. <laughs> and he shouted, why isn't the pump on? And she went, it's after 10, you have to pay first, that's the rule. And he went, oh, what, you don't think I can pay for it? And she went, no, no, that's not what I'm saying, it's after 10, you have to pay first, that's the rule for everybody. I think it's at the point when he picked up a fire extinguisher and started swinging it around. I became really fascinated in the sandwiches at that point. I was like, oh my God, chicken and bacon? Oh, I'm going to read the ingredients on this one. Just staring out blind fear. He's like, nobody thinks I can't pay for this. You, mate, pointing at me, you think I can pay for it. I'm not sure how I did this, because I was nervous and frightened, but I think I just went, oh. <laughs> Hitting myself. <laughs> put the fire extinguisher down. He said, if you don't put that pump on, when I go out there, I'm going to create big problems for you. She said, I'm not going to put the pump on. He did my favourite thing anyone's done in anger. He just threw a Twix on the ground. <laughs> <laughs> Seems like a reasonable response, doesn't it? The old Twix throwing trick. He went over fanning out with his motorbike. I went over with a prawn mayonnaise, if you're interested. And she started, started scanning it really slowly. And I said, are you going to put that pump on? And she went, no. <laughs> Delighted, relishing in it. I scuttled back to the car, locked the doors. He tried to get back into the service station, but cleverly she'd locked the doors to there. So he tried to kick them in, but it didn't work. He's withered down below. So <laughs> picked up a pack of fire logs, started swinging them at the 24 hour window. She knows it's bulletproof glass, so she was just laughing. Just got, <laughs> smoke pissing everywhere. I started the car, tried to drive around, but I'm a polite driver. I'm not going to like beat my horn or anything. He was in the way. So I just. I need the prawn sandwich, to be honest. It's like, you know. <laughs> One thing I forget to do when I'm in the Ford Fiesta is, um, and I slipped that in, didn't I? Someone's got some bloody dollar, haven't they? Ford Fiesta. <laughs> the lights are always sort of on, and there's a little switch, and if you go a little bit, it goes on to sort of mini beam, and if you go a bit further, it goes on to full beam. And because I was nervous and frightened, I clicked onto full beam, but very quickly clicked back, but essentially flashed him. <laughs> he turned and looked at me through the windscreen with these fire logs, just staring into my soul for what felt like an eternity. I farted out of nervousness again. <laughs> and then he just went, oh, so sorry, mate, and walked out of the way. <laughs> I stalled the car and drove home to Berlin. <laughs> it's a good night. It's a good night. Um, did try January again this year for different reasons. I went to the doctor last summer, and I was feeling tired all the time, and he did some tests, and apparently I'm deficient. I'm deficient in vitamins B, D, folic acid, and omega-3. And he said, one, eat better, because I eat loads of trash. And also, go to a pharmacy, get a supplement with all of these in, you'll start to feel better. So I went to Boots. The only supplement that has all of these in is pregnancy support. <laughs> so I've been on pregnancy support for the last few months, and I tell you what, I feel like a pregnant woman. I sit down backwards onto chairs, I do that one, talk about myself the whole fucking time. I'm a pregnant woman. <laughs> Sorry if you're preg, I'm gonna be slagging you off now. It's just... <laughs> I'm turning 30 this year, so many of my friends are having kids. I've got a text, actually, which um, you can use if you'd like. I'm so thrilled with it. If somebody's just had a baby, I'll text them, I'll say, are you sleeping? Because inevitably they won't be, and they go, oh, no, I haven't slept for days, that kind of reply, nonsense. And then I'll go back, and I'm so thrilled with the wording of this, I go back and I say, it'll all be worth it when they're softly stroking your hair as you slip into oblivion. <laughs> it's like Shakespeare, isn't it? Marvellous. Met one of my friend's kids last year, friend I went to university with, her daughter. I avoided this child for four years. She's four years old, I'd heard bad things. Met her last year. She's the worst person I've ever met. <laughs> and I've met Eamon Holmes. <laughs> I, I won't use her real name, that would be unfair. Let's call her Mugabe. And she was very... <laughs> Really. We were sat at dinner and she was here and she was kicking me in the legs and at one point she caught my shin and I went, fuck! She started crying. The mum said, please don't swear in front of my child. I was like, oh, is that your child? I thought someone just condensed North Korea into a small woman, actually. <laughs> Little bitch. But I've got a, um... I've got a 
goddaughter who I adore, she is 11, and I think she might be a genius, because um, she loves painting, and I've got this office in Birmingham, so I took her to the office um, to do some painting, and we painted this mural on the wall, and while we were painting it, I said to her, I said, what do you think art is, just out of curiosity? And she thought about it, and she said, well, it's trust. And I said, what do you mean by that? And she went, well, if you trust something's good, then it is. I was like, fucking hell, that's the most <laughs> profound thing anyone's ever said to me from an 11-year-old. Have another go on the bong, what are you going to say next? <laughs> when the meow meow came out, the thing she was saying, extraordinary. <laughs> so, yes, I'm trying to be healthier. I love a full-fat Coke and I'm on Diet Cokes now and I'm struggling with it, really. I, I, mm. Funnily enough, I was at a university reunion, I was drinking a Diet Coke, and I went up to a girl who I didn't know that well at university, and I was holding this Diet Coke, and I said to her, I said, oh, hello, how are you? What are you up to now? And she went, I hate that. I hate small talk. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not sure how conversation works with you now, then. How did the death of your father affect your sex life? Just straight on in. <laughs> she said, you shouldn't be drinking that. And I said, why? Now, what I think she meant to say was, it's full of Asparta meme. What she actually said was, you shouldn't be drinking that. It's full of apartheid. <laughs> <laughs> I, I knew it was bad, didn't realise it was that bad. Bloody hell! <laughs> I tried being a fruitarian. That's where you can only eat things that have fallen from trees. I managed one day, I had three cooking apples and an owl. <laughs> the best joke of the show. That pissed it away in the first section. There she goes. <laughs> Off she flies. Bless you. I've been reading your tweets. Some fucked up people in this room. Oh! <laughs> right. Um, if I call your name out, um, if I read one of your tweets out, could you stand up for us? Could we have house lights up for this as well, just so I can see them? <laughs> oh, oh, oh. <laughs> oh, also, um, Leon, are you alright? This is Leon, everybody. Say hi, Leon. Are you all right to come out and... So they've said, this is my cameraman, I can do whatever I like with him. <laughs> I mean, if anyone's got suggestions... <laughs> Hello, Leon. <laughs> look, can, look, so we're going to zoom in on people. Oh, lovely, look at that. Let's just have a test. Oh, yes. What, what are these guys? What's your names? Tony. Tony and... Richard. Tony and Richard. How do you know each other, Tony and Richard? Partners. Partners, OK. Well, we've got a lovely picture there. Smile for us. <laughs> Very nice. It's going straight on Twitter when we finish the show. <laughs> Find these men. Um, right, let's have a look at your tweets. Um, there's some really funny ones, really funny ones. Some people didn't really understand. <laughs> oh, love Zoe Ballbag from Fraser, that's good. <laughs> oh, where is Fraser, actually? Stand up, Fra from Fraser C04. Where are you? Hello, Fraser. 103 followers, 104 now, I'm following you. <laughs> and I will follow you home. <laughs> um, you sent in Joe Likes Dick. <laughs> Thanks, mate. He's not wrong. He's not wrong. Just like it. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not in love with it. I like a dick. I like a dick. <laughs> Thanks, Fraser. A round of applause for Fraser. Rather Mel and Sue, somebody's put Bell and Poo. <laughs> <laughs> this one's really nice. Where's Dave Moore? Dave Moore. Tweet time, Dave. Where are you? You up top there as well. You only sent one in, Dave. You haven't given much uh, information on your profile either. You've got 92 followers. Um, the last thing you did was retweet Jonathan Ross. <laughs> this isn't a Jonathan Ross based tweet. What'd you do, Dave? A finance analyst. Gosh, it's boring people up there, isn't it? <laughs> Where do you live, Dave? In Kent. Oh. oh. <laughs> Mix, mixed response from the room for Kent. People down here not sure they like Kent. But then some other people over there love it. Hey, it takes all sorts, doesn't it? <laughs> you sent in, Dave, Tess sucks off your dad daily. That's really nice. <laughs> Really lovely work. Round of applause for Dave. Lovely stuff. <laughs> daily. Sucks off your dad. Daily. <laughs> Mike Blair. Where are you? Pickle246. Where is he? Oh, right at the back. Quite right. <laughs> Let's have a look at your profile. 
22 years old, Arsenal, you're an Arsenal fan. <laughs> Do you watch the game, geezer? <laughs> Great squad, wasn't it? Great squad. <laughs> lovely, um, lovely squad. <laughs> Was there a game today? I don't know, I have no idea. Um, you like tennis, food and travelling, lovely. Mike sent in, Benedict come in her snatch. <laughs> so that's... Great bit of lag banter that movie! <laughs> Did you get a nice shot of him? <laughs> lovely, thanks, Leon. <laughs> You're a bloody <laughs> lifesaver. <laughs> you can't catch me! <laughs> He's good, isn't he? <laughs> Do you... You don't, you don't have to say anything, just nod if, uh, or shake your head. Do you, do you run? Do you, are you a runner? Not really. So, I, if I ran away... <laughs> are you a fighter? <laughs> I'd kill you dead. <laughs> oh, he's frightened now! God, I've never felt more masculine. <laughs> I've got a weapon as well. I was going to do it then. Asking as a Birmingham gay myself, when did King's Heath become Brum's newest gay quarter? Did this happen overnight? <laughs> Correct. <laughs> That's exactly what happened. Well done. I, I had been seeding it into the gay community because I'd set up a fake grinder account called Sugar Daddy, which is uh, it's like a dating app, like Tinder, but for gay people. And um, I just seeded it into conversations, get it in their subconscious, this sort of thing. He started, he said, where are you based? I said, King's Heath. It's a gay village now. I was giving him the idea. He said, sure, you into piss play? <laughs> It's 11.39am, darling, but, you know, you do you, you do you. Nobody spotted that Sugar Daddy is Alan Sugar, though, so that's good, isn't it? That's good. <laughs> I, think, um, I think some of the resistance was because we do have a gay village in Birmingham. It's called the Gay Village. It's in the centre of town. And I went out there not long after all this had started, and I went to a place called Sequin Showstoppers, where they sell drag clothes. I was trying on some bits. It was a day-drinking day, you can tell from my eyes. <laughs> Hello, darkness, my old friend. And after I'd left Sequin Showstoppers, went for a few pints and ended up at a house party with about a dozen gay guys and they were all talking about it. And I was so drunk, I didn't want to give anything away. And this one guy started and he was like, have you seen that King's Heat's a gay village now? And I was like, yeah. He's like, it's probably just like one bloke who set up a website. And I was like, yeah, probably. <laughs> and a limited company under bank accounts, actually. It was quite complicated, actually. It was quite, it was quite involved, actually. And then this other guy popped up out of nowhere and he was so cross about it. He was like, I'm sorry, King's Heat is not a gay village. In no world is King's Heath a gay village. We have a gay village in town. It's called the Gay Village. They have a pride march there every year. And I was like, oh, right, is that what you have to do to be a gay village? You have a pride march? And he went, yeah. And I was like, oh. <laughs> so that was the final piece in the puzzle. In order to convince the gays that King's Heath was a gay village, I had to run a pride march. Now, immediately, as Ken emailed the Hare and Hounds, and uh, Adam Regan, who runs the Hare and Hounds, very nice man, he replied very positively, but said, this is quite big to deal with over email. We should speak about this on the phone, really. I'd not been keen speaking on the phone as Ken, because I'm not great at accents, but it was time for Ken Roberts to speak on the phone. Hello. Adam Regan, it's Ken Roberts from the Gayberhood Foundation. Hello, mate. I wanted to talk about doing a Pride March in King's Heath. Oh, right, okay. 26th of September, yeah, I'll pencil that now. I'll wait for you to confirm it. That's fantastic. Thank you, Mr. Regan. I'll leave you to your day. Remember, you can only ever be yourself unless you're Ken Roberts. <laughs> Thanks, Ken. Cheers, mate. Thanks, mate. Bye bye. I'm doing a Pride March in three weeks. Should we take a selfie using that camera? Is that possible? Uh, where should we do it from? Maybe back here? You all want to be in a selfie? Yeah. Why not? Can, like, can I hold it like I'm doing a... <laughs> Smile, everyone. <laughs> cool, I think we've got it. Round of applause for Leon! Thanks, Leon. Right, let's talk about art now. I'd like to talk about art. <laughs> yeah, a bit of culture. Uh, my mother retired a few years ago, and she's now um, painting in her retirement. This is one of my mother's paintings. Isn't that glorious? This is of our family friend Patrick. Not only does it look like Patrick, I feel like it captures his essence. A beautiful painting. Based on these, I've been inspired to do my own. They've not come out as well, I'm going to be honest with you. 
how did one of Amanda Holden with a Britain's Got Talent buzzer for a head? Slightly different things that we do. <laughs> Mum will do this sort of thing, two women on a bench having a conversation, beautiful, skillful watercolour there, the skill and the time it takes to do something like that. I did a man having coffee poured in his ass. We're just doing different things. <laughs> We're doing different things. This came out of, I was on holiday with a friend of mine who just had a colonic irrigation. I've never had one, so I was like, what's it like? He's like, I've not had one either. This girl, quite attractive, took me into a room, put a tube up. I thought the tube did everything, but actually she took it out, stood me over this thing and then just said, go. And she said, I can wait here, I can wait outside, whatever you want. I was like, who's asking her to stop? Stay! <laughs> no! Look me in the eye! <laughs> I'd like us to share this! <laughs> so, based on that, I did this painting. I haven't got a name for it yet. I was thinking maybe Britain in Springtime, but I'm open to suggestions. Please <laughs> send your tweets in. This uh, art thing has got to a bit of a head just this week, actually. Um, Mum and I, we submitted to the Royal Academy. Every year, the Royal Academy take paintings from amateurs, from professionals, whatever. They also take sculptures. Mum submitted two of her paintings, beautiful paintings. I submitted for a laugh. I knew I wasn't going to get in. I submitted this sculpture, which I called Chris, <laughs> and made it pissed last summer. I just submitted it, forgot about it. A few weeks later, I got an email from the Royal Academy that read this. Dear Joe, it's come to our attention that the price of your artwork, Chris, is ten and a half million pounds. <laughs> I was originally going to do ten and I thought, fuck it, put the other half on. <laughs> Owing to the highest selling price, we just wanted to check this was correct and this is what we would like to have printed in our list of works should your work be selected for the exhibition. If you did wish for this to be the published price, could you kindly advise on the insurance value of the work? Well, I went back to them and I said, gosh, did I really put ten and a half million pounds? It should be twelve and a half million pounds. <laughs> and then just put Brexit for no reason. <laughs> I recently took it to Bonhams to get it valued. They asked me to leave, but I expect the insurance value is £4.99 or the equivalent in Argos vouchers. <laughs> didn't receive a reply, didn't expect a reply, to be honest. I thought, right, that's, you know, it's not going to get in. Suddenly, we both get emails. Mum's paintings rejected. Chris is in. I go, <laughs> go to the Royal Academy. I went there on Monday. There I am outside, very excited. All the other sculptures are on plinths. I'm like, bloody hell, Chris is going to be on a plinth in the Royal Academy. The Royal Academy! Walking around, can't find him anywhere. They've only put him in the fucking corner, haven't they? Gee <laughs> he is available to purchase for twelve and a half million pounds. <laughs> I will not accept offers. Mum's really annoyed at the minute, the relationship's frayed. This started, I was living with them last year, and they got annoyed with my bathroom habits. I love a long bath, and I love to eat in the bath, and I had some Greek yoghurt in the bath. Because I'm in show business. And unbeknownst to me, some of the yoghurt ended up in the bath. I then went into my room to get changed. Mum comes into the bathroom, looks in the bath. She's like, have you had the biggest wank anyone's ever had? <laughs> I came in, there's blueberries in there. I was like, oh, yeah, I've shut out perfect blueberries as well, Helen. Just squeeze those through my urethra. <laughs> so, yes, live in Birmingham, live in Birmingham. Um, Birmingham was described recently on Fox News, the reputable news source that is Fox News, as 100% Muslim. <laughs> salam alaikum. <laughs> alaikum salam is what you say back. Don't worry, we'll work it out. It's interesting that, because I was in the Middle East when that news came out. I was doing shows. I was in Abu Dhabi, Doha and Dubai. Friends of mine told me not to go to the Middle East because they said that they don't like, and I quote, my lot, is what they said. <laughs> not sure what they mean by my lot. Presumably fly fishers. <laughs> Um, they jail homosexuals in those countries. Not sure of the logic of that one, really. Oh, you like men? We'll put you in a box with some. Not a punishment. Come on, try harder, lads. I thought, I thought that they stoned gays to death out there, but it's just that gays can't catch. <laughs> right. Structurally, a very good joke, that, but it's on the edge. I agree. Now... <laughs> 100% Muslim. I said 100% Muslim. There's a sort of truth in it. There's a lot of Muslims in Birmingham. A lot of all cultures there. We're known for being multicultural. Quite good at it, really. Our next-door neighbours are Muslim. Saj is a lovely guy. Loves a fucking power tool on a Sunday, but he's a lovely guy. <laughs> Shut up, Saj! One of the most famous Muslims in Birmingham is Malala Yousafzai. I don't know if people are familiar with her. If you don't, she's brilliant. She's an 18-year-old schoolgirl who was shot at by the Taliban for wanting to be educated. She now goes to... Edgebaston High School for Girls. It's a private school. I don't think she pays the fees. <laughs> I, I, 
personally would hate to go to school with Malala Yousafzai. Can you imagine show and tell day with Malala, where they're like, OK, class, what have you brought in? Um, Sally, let's start with you. And Sally goes, I've brought in this papier-mâché cat. <laughs> OK, anyone else bring anything? Malala, did you bring anything in? This Nobel Peace Prize. <laughs> Sally, you're a piece of shit. <laughs> I'd hate to be a teacher as well. You want me to tell Malala off or anything? What are you doing on your phone, Malala? Texting Barack Obama, actually, so... <laughs> oh, sorry. Um, Sally, you're a piece of shit. <laughs> Poor Sally, just made her up. Um, no, I was annoyed about that. I was annoyed when that news came out. I'm annoyed with Donald Trump as well. Little side project I've got going on. I'm trying to book Syrian refugees into Donald Trump's hotels. <laughs> That's not going on. Going on. Um, Okay, it's going okay. I was annoyed when, yeah, when Fox News said that we're 100% Muslim because there's a subtext to that. When they say we're 100% Muslim, what they're saying there is that we should be worried about that. There's something terrifying, frightening about Muslims. I think we've got a problem. I think we're using the word Muslim far too quickly to describe people doing atrocities when they don't represent Muslims any more than I do. And I think we should be using a more accurate word for those people, which I'm going to argue is knobhead. <laughs> There'd be levels of knobhead. You'd have a moderate knobhead, all the way up to fundamental knobhead. <laughs> and if we all did it, if we all did it, the news would have to catch up. They'd have to go, today, two knobheads bombed a car. They'd have to do it if we all did it. <laughs> and it wouldn't necessarily be to do with just terrorist activity. Any knobheady activity would get the knobhead word. I've thought of some. Um, people that wear a festival wristband after a festival. <laughs> I went to Reading. It's November, you're in a Costa. You're a knobhead. <laughs> Couples that put a lock on a bridge, you're both knobheads. Sorry. <laughs> Hate that. Hate it. Um, sanctimonious mothers. I've got to be careful here. I don't mean all mothers. Just a lot of my friends are having children at the minute. And it's the sort of mothers that go, don't tell me how to raise my kids. And you're like, OK, but... She is trying to eat a petit velu with an electric razor, so... <laughs> You're a bit of a knobhead, aren't you? Ever so slightly. <laughs> Amanda Holden, fundamental knobhead. I just don't like it. <laughs> don't, don't encourage me, because I'm sure she's lovely. I just... I think she's despicable. <laughs> she did to our Les. Um, <laughs> Still holding on to that after 10 years. <laughs> now, guys, I want to tell you about a little project I've been working on for the last year. And there's no nice way of saying this. There's no easy way of saying this. I'm just going to have to rip the plaster off. For the last year, just under a year, I have been trying to destroy the career of Tom Daly. There's no easy way of saying it. I've said it. It's, gone. it's out there now. I've said it. I've said it. I should caveat all of this by saying I think Tom Daly's amazing in lots of ways. He's an Olympic diver, I'm sure you're aware of Tom Daly. He's gay. I think he was pushed into coming out as gay before he was necessarily ready. There was a lot of fuss about it from the gay press, and he's been a brilliant gay rights advocate in lots of ways. Um, you might have seen that him and his husband Lance Black announced a few months ago that they're having a baby together. Shouldn't be a brave thing to do in this day and age, but it was. He got a lot of nastiness, and he's been serene throughout the whole thing, so I do think he's brilliant. However, I now want to slag him off. So... <laughs> Tom Daly irked me last summer for two reasons, two Instagram posts, and I'll show them to you now. This is the first one, this is him at Gay Pride. Love the way that he's extending his arm out there to show the parade march there. Love the look of a smile on his face, beautiful framing there. Before I go into too much detail about this, what's going on with the hand? Where is the other finger? I've looked at it loads. <laughs> loads. I don't know if it's a lighting thing, whether it was edited out. I can't, I don't know how that happens. I've got no issue with any of that, really, apart from the weird finger. I've got no issue with this other post. Beautifully framed again. His skin looks radiant in that little triangle. Marvellous. Brave to wear a tank top, but he seems to manage it. I think it's wonderful. It's lovely. I've got no issue with any of this thing. It's all brilliant. I've no issue with any of this as well. Happy Pride, everyone. It's been so awesome to take part in my first ever Pride. It had not been before. But let's not forget why we have this day and how much more we have to fight for in many other social justice movements around the world. No issue with any of that. Brilliant that he went to Pride. I think we all should at some point in our lives. It's good fun, if nothing else. 
Pants. My issue with both of these posts is not what's in them, it's what's underneath them, and that is this. At Barclays UK, hashtag ad. That means that Tom Daly was sponsored by Barclays to go to Pride. And I don't have a problem with Tom Daly being sponsored to do lots of things. I understand when you're an athlete, you've got to make your money while you can. You're not monetizable forever, you might break your leg. Totally get being sponsored, but to be sponsored to go to Pride, which is a political event, it made me uncomfortable. It's sort of like going Black Lives Matter with Tesco. It made me uncomfortable. <laughs> And I didn't want to make a big deal of this. I thought it's an error in judgment in some ways. Didn't want to make a big fuss about it. All I thought I'd do is a bit of light trolling of Tom Daly. That's all I thought I'd do. So what I did is I went onto this very post and I commented on it with hashtags of rival banks. That's all I did. Hashtag <laughs> Matt West, hashtag Santander, hashtag HSBC. And for some reason, dozens of other people started doing it as well. Hashtag Northern Rock, a nice nostalgic one. Viet Cong Bank, an international one. Dozens of people did this, and I know that celebrities get paid loads for this. Barclays will have had a PR team all over it. I should mention that I've trolled Tom Daly in a lot lighter way about three years ago. He posted to his Twitter a little post basically saying, just take the image below, personalise it. Just wanted you to customise an image in your own way. That's all he wanted you to do. Of course, I put him in a smack den. Who wouldn't in my position? <laughs> Open bloody goal, Tom. So that was it, really, as far as I was concerned. I've done my post, other people have commented, point made. It was, in, I felt an error in judgment, that was it. Next day, I get a phone call. It's from a friend of mine who's a photographer. He's photographed the Olympic diving team on a few occasions, and he's also photographed me. And he said, Joe, you need to go on Ross Haslam's Instagram. Now, I didn't know who Ross Haslam was at the time. He is another British diver who went to Budapest the day after Pride with Tom Daly for a competition. And he posted a video. The video you don't necessarily need to see. I will show it to you. It's a panoramic of Budapest. It's done weirdly. It's a portrait thing, but he's done it on landscape, which I don't understand. Also, the sound in the background's not great, so I will play it to you twice. But you can hear in the background Tom Daly's voice, and I just want you to listen out for it. Have a listen to this clearly now. Now, he might be saying the lighting situation, but I think Tom Daly says the lysit situation. <laughs> Have another listen, just to double check. The, of the whole, uh, the situation. Does that sound like Lysit to you? I'm a situation. <laughs> Not sure who he's talking to in that clip. Presumably the assassin he's got to take me out. <laughs> I like the Lysit situation. I'm going to write a book, The Lysit Situation. There's the cover. <laughs> Yes, lockdown um, got in the way of doing stand-up. I was meant to do this tour a lot sooner. And um, I had my jab. I had my jab. This is me having my jab. And the nurse said, oh, do take a photo and, and put it on Instagram. We're trying to promote the vaccine. She hadn't considered I might put a caption with it. I, um, I put, uh, just wanted a Tuesday afternoon strippogram and now I'm hooked on mess. <laughs> and then underneath, this post was sponsored by Microsoft Shoe Zone and Screwfix. Oh! Anti-vaxxers are out in force. Someone called me a foot soldier of tyranny. I love that. That's going on the posters next year. Someone else said, idiot, I bet he was paid thousands for this and didn't even take the vaccine. You got me there. Shoe Zone did pay me thousands. Fair play. I get it. It was scary to have the vaccine. A friend of mine was absolutely terrified. She had it and then afterwards she said, I don't want to think about it. I just want to get drunk. And we had three bottles between us. And the next morning she rang me and she went, Joe, I've had a terrible reaction to the vaccine. I was like, <laughs> It might be the Gavi de Gavi, darling. I said, what are your symptoms? She went, oh, I've got a terrible headache. And weirdly, a brand new tattoo. <laughs> That's the vaccine. I've, um, I've got this neighbour who's very handsome. He lives a few doors down from me. He's called George. And I, um, I never know what he's up to. He's always doing weird stuff. Because he, he rang me the once and he said, have you got a flat-headed screwdriver? And I looked and I said, I haven't got one, sorry. And he went, never mind, any hummus? <laughs> I don't know what you're doing. And I got COVID on the 1st of January this year, and he rang me on the 5th, and he said, are you all right, Joe? I've not seen you come out of your house. And I said, I'm absolutely fine, George. I've, uh, I've got COVID, but I'm, I'm isolating. I've got no symptoms. I'm absolutely fine. And I said, how are you? And he went, oh, nightmare. I was meant to go to France, but they've closed the borders, and the insurance doesn't pay out if they close the borders. only pay out if I get COVID. And I said, oh, I'm sorry to hear that, George. And he went, can I come round? <laughs> A hot guy wants to come round to get an infectious disease off me to fuck off an insurance company. I've had dreams about this shit. <laughs> and I thought about it. 
about it. And I thought, fuck it. So I invited him round. We had a few beers. Had a lovely time. He left. He got a positive PCR test. But he's an anti-vaxxer and he died. <laughs> R.I.P. George. <laughs> Little twist in that one. <laughs> Didn't see that one coming, did you? Oh, it's all good fun. This is all good fun.